Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. We are so excited to present our speaker today, Dr. Sonia Michael, who is a past resident. And so um, Dr. Bates was kind enough to give her a tour of the hospital. Big changes since she was when she was here. So that's that's been fun. For those of you on Teams, just a quick reminder, please make sure that you mute yourself. Don't hit mute all. That mutes the speaker. Just mute yourself. Otherwise, we can all hear your conversations. For Q&A, when Dr. Michael is done with her lecture, we think we ask that, that you just go ahead and unmute yourself for Q&A and go ahead and ask your question out loud. The problem with chat is we don't always get to them right away. And so if you can just ask, go ahead and ask the questions out loud. She will hear you. We will all hear you. And then you can get your answer right away. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Dr. Bates is going to do the introduction and just sit back and enjoy this fantastic lecture. Thanks, Shazad. Uh, happy, hello, everybody. Um, I'm really privileged to be able to introduce Dr. Michael. I've known you for years. When you were a young faculty here and I was a young faculty in Cincinnati, um, she has risen in the ranks in LA, is professor of clinical pediatrics, and recently became the vice chair for faculty development uh, at Children's Hospital of LA and uh, the University of Southern California. Um, she went to medical school in Cairo, did her pediatric training in East Lansing, um, and her pediatric uh, GI in Omaha uh, before coming here in 1997, when this was a much different institution. Um, and she rose to division chief in 2008 uh, before deciding to head west, um, where she's been very successful. She's authored more than 70 papers and book chapters, et cetera, participated in numerous national committees, uh, research supported by the NIH and other agencies, and uh, has a longstanding interest in translational research on the gut microbiome and its impact on pediatric health and disease. And today she'll be discussing these interests in her talk, which is titled, Unlocking the Mysteries of the Gut Microbiome, Back to Where It Started. Dr. Michael, thank you for coming. Dad, Dad. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bates. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, great, awesome. Um, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here today, and thank you so much for the opportunity to um, share some of. Um, can people mute themselves, please? Thank you. Um, so it's a real pleasure and honor to be here, and I'm so happy to um, be uh, with you today talking about something that's near and dear to my heart that started right here, uh, four floors up in, in the GI lab. So we're excited to share some of that with you. So unlocking the mysteries of the gut microbiome back to where it started, back to Dayton. Um, so... Uh, I figure out how to manage this. <laughs> so no GI talk I should go unnoticed without a poop joke, right? Uh, but I promise it's going to be very little. So <laughs> it will ease on when it comes to the, to the jokes. Uh, sometimes all you need in life is a good poop. And the face you make when you finally poop. So relaxed. <laughs> okay, enough of this um, uh, crazy stuff. So. We're going to be talking about, um, you know, the gut microbiome. So it's um, anywhere you go, like with, um, you know, meetings and uh, conferences and stuff like that, you will be hearing about the gut microbiome. I don't think it's going to go away anytime in the near future. Um, and there are many discoveries that are happening that are very exciting. So I wanted to share just a little bit of that as we go uh, with our talk today. Um, so here are some objectives. We're going to learn together the importance of the gut microbiome in health. So it's important in health. <laughs> Understand the role of the gut microbiome in disease. It's important in disease. Understand ways of modifying the gut microbiome. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> so um, we uh, will be discussing 
that we're going to start off with a definition. So hopefully that's a good good place to start. And then we're going to um, focus a little bit on the microbiome and health. You know, why are the bacteria, the viruses inside our intestines important uh, for us? How can we modify the microbiome? So if the microbiome is so important for health, you know, what do we do? How can we like take care of it? How do we modify it so it does what it needs to do to uh, change us from disease state to health state? And then finally, we're going to be talking a little bit about what is the role of the primary care provider in preserving the microbiome. So yeah, the microbiome is great, but what do I do, right? So um, we're going to start off with the definition of the microbiome. So what exactly is it? Is it? Um, so there's been a lot of definitions. If you look this up, there's going to be like 100 definitions out there. But um, the one that was uh, given by the Human Microbiome Project, which is like the biggest project um, in the United States that had looked at what the microbiome really is, had come up with that def definition. It's the ecological uh, community of commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that literally share our body space. And that space can be anything, right? It can be, um, you know, we have this cloud in that picture. You know, there's a cloud of organisms that kind of move with us. As I move forward, you know, my microbiome is kind of like swimming around me. Um, some on the skin, some inside the GI uh, tract and so on. And of course, as um, pediatric gastroenterologists, we think that the uh, best part of the microbiome is which one? The gut microbiome, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so um, it's uh, a super organ, considered a super organ. It's, there's a lot more cells um, in the, uh, in the, um, uh, within these organisms than our human cells like totaled. Um, also, many more genes within these microorganisms that basically outnumber the, organis the, the genes that are within the human body. And there's more than 100 trillion of these organisms. So there's a massive amount of, um, you know, the microbiome, and some people consider that an organ. Okay, so now we know kind of what a microbiome is, right? So it, um, it consists of multiple uh, parts uh, for the microbiome. So some are the ones that you're probably familiar with would be bacteria, right? So that's the one, uh, not necessarily the biggest part of the microbiome, but um, a big part of what we know about the microbiome, because the, vi the uh, bacteria are a little bit easier to understand, a little bit easier to sequence, know what kind of uh, bacteria are living there versus viruses, for example. The viruses are a little bit harder um, to sequence and a little bit harder to follow through. But there is the virome. It's not a... Uh, uh, you know, a park ride at uh, Kings Island or anything, it's a true thing. There's, um, you know, the virum part, um, by, um, uh, by the number of organisms, the virums actually win. But the viruses, as you know, are smaller than the bacteria. I hope there are infectious disease people here in the room to correct me. <laughs> but the viruses are much smaller, right? Some of them actually chew, uh, like they're part of the, inside the part of the bacteria, like phages. So they're much smaller, um, but there's so many of them. And sometimes they even outnum outnumber the, the bacteria, but because of their size, there's still a little bit of a smaller space occupied by the microbiome. So um, not, not only that, there's also fungi, right? So there are different organisms that can be found within a healthy microbiome. Um, so just some milestones of, um, you know, what had happened in the past, right? So um, in the old days before I became a fellow, and I'll show you my age in just a second here, is I did my fellowship in 1994 to 1997. So before that, um, the PCR was just starting. So before that, it was like just cultures. So you, you get a bunch of poop, if you want, and you plate them on, um, you know, culture media and see what you get, Right. But that was not adequate because that was um, just skimming the surface of what would be in there, um, because those organisms are not culturable. Most of the most of them are not cultural. So that's in the 1900s. In 1990, 1990, 1990. Uh, uh, so um, in, in the 1990s, that's when I started uh, doing my training. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Okay, 
So um, we started uh, introducing molecular techniques like uh, PCR. You're able to um, make you know, the uh, genetic material DNA bigger, right? And that's how you would um, start to understand what's in there by looking at you know, PCRs. And then in 2008, the NIH started thinking about um, having, you know, people that know what they're doing. <laughs> um, you know, to some extent, we didn't really know what we were doing in 2008, but they had this, uh, you know, a big amount of money um, that they gave mostly to, um, uh, to Wash U um, to figure out what is going on with that microbiome. So they started looking at what a healthy microbiome looked like. They had 300 people, and they uh, were basically were able to sequence some of the organisms, specifically the bacteria at that time, and they were able to tell us what a healthy microbiome catalog looks like. And then now it's the uh, omics era. So it's not only... Um, it, it's not enough to say who lives there, like E. coli or whatever the organism might be, we also have to understand what they're doing. You know, are they producing metabolites? Are they producing inflammatory things that cause inflammatory bowel disease? Are, what are they doing? What is the function of these organisms? So that's the era that we're, we're kind of uh, looking at at this point. So um, where does the microbiome come from? Does it, you know, all of a sudden exist? Um, and what happens at colonization at birth? So there are actually some thoughts that um, there's some DNA coming from organisms that actually live in the placenta, or some of the studies have suggested that. Not all of the studies agree. They think maybe there's a contamination issue uh, with those um, um, studies. Uh, some people think amniotic fluid may have organisms that uh, have escaped from the uh, microbiome of mom going up to the baby and starting you know, uh, their effect on the immune system because organisms in general are very potent um, uh, inducers of uh, you know, immune reactions and so on. So that's still debatable, but there's, there's some um, thought or some data to suggest that perhaps maybe the microbiome is there even before a baby is born. So traditional thinking is a baby is born, everything is sterile, right? So that's kind of being... Um, challenged at this point. So let's talk a little bit about the microbiome and health. What does that look like? So um, if you look at the mode of uh, delivery, um, and so this is something called PC, PC, PCOA plot. I had no idea what that was until I you know, started doing this type of research. So basically, there see those balls, they have different colors, right? So you have pink, you have red, you have dark blue, you have uh, light blue. If those balls are um, like overlapping, then they're identical. If they're close to each other, then they're similar. If they're away from each other, then, then they're very different. So if you, um, if you look at, um, I don't know if you're able to see my cursor. Um, if you look at the blues, um, so the dark blue is skin, from mom, and the light blue is a baby born by C-section. That's the microbiome of a baby born by C-section. So you could see that a baby born by C-section um, populates the microbiome with skin flora of the mom, which makes sense, right? So that's the first environment that the baby is exposed to. But on the other hand, if you look at the pink and the red, um, that's basically uh, the baby born by vaginal delivery and mom's uh, microbiome, vaginal microbiome. So you, you know that babies that are born by C-section, you know, they're far apart. You see the light blue is very far from the pink. They cluster together alone and away from, you know, a baby born by vaginal delivery. What does that mean? I mean, it could mean that the things that are associated with um, uh, vaginal delivery, the, the health um, claims of... Uh, you know, babies born by uh, vaginal delivery versus C-section, like, for example, there's, there's data to suggest that perhaps asthma is more likely to happen in a baby who's born by C-section, um, and, you know, being born vaginally is more protective, for example, for asthma. So this could be the explanation for why, you know, babies that are born <laughs> vaginally are, are, have different 
um, you know, risks for developing certain diseases. So maybe it's because their microbiome is different, um, you know, at the time related to the mode of birth. So, you know, scientists and especially gastroenterologists are crazy people. So, uh, you know, we see that you know, babies born vaginally have a different microbiome than the babies born by C-section. So guess what they try to do? They try to uh, have a baby born by C-section uh, develop a microbiome that's uh, similar to a baby born vaginally. So what did they do? They had, um, you know, the microbiome from a mom, from the vaginal microbiome, and basically they painted all this uh, over <laughs> for the baby at the time of birth. And were they successful? Absolutely. It's kind of like a big slide of like, you know, a lot of data, but the bottom line is yes, they were able to replicate, uh, you know, a vaginal microbiome developing a baby uh, who is born by C-section. So instead of the skin microbiome, and usually the skin microbiome in the gut is bad news. Like Staph aureus, for example, when you see that in the microbiome of uh, children with uh, various disorders, it's usually really bad news. Especially things like inflammatory bowel disease. All right, so yes, you can change the microbiome. Is that going to help with anything? Who knows? I mean, those are babies that were just born, you know, a few years ago, so they haven't been old enough uh, for people to go back and say, oh, well, this is protective for this, or this is not protective for that. So um, stay tuned for that. Okay, so we talked about the mode of delivery, how how that changes the microbiome of the baby being born. Um, now we're going to talk about the age and the developing microbiome. Um, you could see that as the baby is born, you have certain populations, certain organisms that populate the microbiome. And as the baby grows up, um, traditionally the thinking is, you know, at age two, the microbiome becomes like a grown-up. Um, that's not exactly true. We can challenge that uh, paradigm right here from data that we got from uh, you know, older patients here in Dayton, compared to young adults, you're talking about, you know, kids who are 17, and young adults that are 20. So even though there's a very small age difference, but we could actually see the differences between the microbiome of an older child versus an adult. So kids are not little uh, adults. They, they have their own personality. They have their own microbiome. Um, okay, and this is um, the data that we show. Remember the PCI plot, like if they're uh, clustered together, they're similar. If they're far from each other, they're different. So you see the green is a difference from the pink, you know, the young adult versus the um, older children. So mode of delivery and age. All right, even uh, race can actually change the gut microbiome. That's a little bit tough to, to study. Age comes with a lot of other, uh, race comes with a lot of other things because it comes with diet, it comes with you know, genetic information, it comes with a lot of things that could be very different. But this particular study was able to tease that out and saying, you know, certain populations, certain races um, have different microbiomes from other races. So when we're actually doing studies, so for example, in Los Angeles, there's a lot of kids of um, Hispanic heritage. So they may have a, a different microbiome just because of their uh, ethnicity. So you have to keep that in mind. The reason I bring this up is, you know, not all, you know, there's so many um, differences in the microbiome that we need to be, um, you know, cognizant of. Okay, the gut microbiome and diet. You are what you eat, right? <laughs> um, cucumber or tomatoes. Um, so this, um, this study is interesting. So all this stuff that you see here, if you focus on um, the, um, the graph on the right side, this looks at the maternal diet and that, how that translates into the, the gut microbiome of the baby. So these points reflect the microbiome of the baby, right? but in relation to what mom has been eating while she was pregnant, right? So it depends on how much fruits and vegetables the mom has been consuming. And you can see differences there in the microbiome by the amount of fruits and vegetables that that particular mom has been consuming. And now it's reflecting on the microbiome of the baby's born. So, um, uh, 
uh, interesting data. And same thing with uh, dairy. How much dairy does mom consume, you know, during pregnancy? And what kind of, what kind of microbiome um, that particular baby had developed after birth? So a lot of the things that happen in utero are also being um, part of the equation of what happens to the uh, baby's microbiome. So we talked about a few things now so far. We talked about the mode of delivery, C-section versus vaginal delivery. We talked about um, race and ethnicity. We talked about diet. Um, and then um, one thing about the maternal diet is uh, an interesting study that showed that mothers who consume more food during pregnancy gave birth to children who performed better on developmental uh, testing at one year. So uh, when I saw this, uh, this is in 2016, all of our kids were born. So when I told them that they're uh, not smart enough because I didn't <laughs> eat enough fruit when I was pregnant with them. Maybe if I did all uh, some apples or something, they would have started listening to their mom. All right, so um, what other things, what other uh, parameters? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of what can actually factor into the microbiome of the baby. So um, this is one of the studies um, that was uh, done at the child study uh, from Canada. So the Canadians are a little bit different from um, up here in the States. Um, they um, did many months of um, maternity leave for moms. I believe it's at least a year, so it's true. Um, and so this study had 1,500 babies. So they started off with moms. They were looking for different like environmental triggers. You know, what, what goes into the microbiome, what goes into the health of the baby in general. And so they have this massive amount of knowledge and massive amount of stool tests or fecal samples that they collected. And um, they, some of the data is now starting to, those, that cohort is about probably six or seven years right now. So th these are data that were collected from a baby that came after they were born. And if you look at the box, the blue box on the right side on the top, um, you can see here, uh, no VF, I don't know if it's projecting in the back of here or not, but the, the first column, no, no VF means no uh, breastfeeding, right? Um, and then partial VF, partial breastfeeding, and then exclusive breastfeeding after hospital. I'll tell you what that means. Um, and then exclusive VF or exclusive breastfeeding, right? So if you look at the end one here, exclusive breastfeeding, and all these colored stacks, they're all different kinds of. You can hear me okay now? A little bit of a... Okay, no problem. All right, sorry, I won't be able to move. <laughs> okay, can you all hear me still okay? Awesome. Okay, so if you look at this here, this exclusive breastfeeding, and these stacks are just different kinds of organisms that live there, right? So you see that the breastfeeding is a little bit different from the formula-fed babies, right? So which is a no-brainer, right? You would think that, yes, the breast milk will allow certain bacteria to grow, um, and especially uh, 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 human milk oligosaccharides, those are like prebiotics, so they allow certain bacteria to grow, especially uh, bifidobacteria. So um, it's not surprising that the uh, breastfed babies have their own kind of uh, look to their microbiome, right? 
But what's surprising is the second one, the partial BF, partial breastfeeding. So this is a baby who had been, um, let's say, in the uh, nursery and wasn't able to drink enough milk, right? Mom didn't have enough breast milk. And they gave the baby a bottle or two of uh, formula and then back to breast milk. Those babies actually have pretty similar uh, profile to, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, exclusive breastfed. Um, so not to be, you can't really... I'm sorry, the partial breastfed is like partial breast with some formula, some breast milk, right? But the hospital one is the one where, you know, there's not enough breast milk and they're giving the baby, you know, a bottle or two of the formula and then the baby's back again to breastfeeding. So you could see that the, um, the profile, the, the gut microbiome profile of the, the third line here is very similar to the last one. So just a, a bottle here or there is not something that would really change the microbiome that much. Okay. So um, form, formula feeding significantly alters the gut microbiome, as we saw in the, um, in the other slide, but single bottle feeding doesn't significantly impact the microbiome. Um, so uh, another poop joke. <laughs> poop jokes aren't my favorite. <laughs> They're solid. Okay, the microbiome and disease. So we'll talk about obesity and the microbiome. That's a very hot topic, and there's a lot of things happening in that. Um, arena. Um, so this started a while back uh, from animal studies, right? So they had um, the, the same group that got all the NIH money <laughs> a long time ago. Um, they had um, uh, animal models of obesity, right? So you have an obese mouse and you have a lean mouse. So um, you remember the PCOA plot? So if they cluster together, they're similar. If they're away from each other, then they're different. So here you're looking at um, the red, which are the lean mice, and the blue, which are the obese mice. And they, they look different. You're looking at their microbiome, and they look different from each other, right? So that was like, okay, fine. <laughs> All right. So what was very uh, interesting is that obesogenic trait like being an obese mouse in their lab, uh, could be transferred. So you have, you know, lean mice in a cage, and you're giving them the microbiome of an obese mouse. That's all you're doing. Then those lean mice all of a sudden become obese. And it's like, wait a second. Okay, so then the microbiome has something to do with obesity, right? Just transferring those... Uh, microbes or those organisms from one mouse to the other would make more fat deposit in, you know, in their body, they become obese. So um, that was kind of an eye opener about what um, the, the microbiome can, can do or cannot do, especially with regards to that. And so, you know, I thought, okay, so the mice ate more um, and they became obese. It makes sense, right? But they didn't. It was the exact opposite. So if you look at um, here, k calories but instead of per kilo because they're little, it's per gram of, of the animals, right? And um, the lean um, and the obese, the obese mice actually ate less of the food or less of the calories compared to the um, to the lean mice. So what that tells us is, you know, the microbiome is like the gate. And, you know, the calories are coming from the mouth or, you know, people are taking in uh, calories. And the gut microbiome is like the gate that allows certain calories to move into the body or certain calories to be lost in the poop. So, um, again, that was one of the things that uh, made us, you know, think of the microbiome as an organ that can actually change things. Um, so... This was interesting, and the, for the gastroenterologists in the room, we can probably all fatten anybody, right? <laughs> we can even CPN them. We can like give them like more calories in their formula. We can uh, even put a nasal, be obnoxious, put a nasogastric tube and like feed them, or you know, if all fails, you know, TPN them. But can really many of us change a, an obese child to a, a a thin child? That was the question when I saw. Um, the paper that came out, um, this one here, um, in 2006, I was asking myself, what about the opposite? Because the opposite is, 
in my opinion, something that's more significant. And that was 2006, right? In 2013, so that's what, um, seven years later, um, this came out, same group. And they were saying that if you co-house, um, you know, an obese mouse, mouse with a lean mouse, um, then the obese mouse may actually uh, um, lose some of the obesogenic traits. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all. Um, so, yeah, it can happen, but <laughs> not as easy as the other way around. Oops. So, uh, one of the things that we were interested in is looking at uh, fatty liver. And this is actually data from Dayton here, um, where we looked at... Um, children that have fatty uh, fatty liver and what kind of metabolites are being produced you know because you know someone who has fatty liver is different from someone who doesn't have fatty liver even though the body mass index may be the same right so we were looking at what those bacteria were actually doing not just like who is there as we um, discussed early in the in the talk but what are they doing what are they producing so uh, we were able to show that, you know, the kids that have fatty liver are producing different metabolites than the ones that don't have um, fatty liver, even though the body mass index is similar. Um, and what's even more important um, is that we made a discovery here that the alcohol, you know, some of the bacteria produce alcohol, right? Fermentation. So um, some of these, the bacteria in the gut of children that have non-alcoholic fatty liver, they're producing a lot more alcohol than the kids that have similar BMI that do not have non-alcoholic fatty liver. So perhaps, you know, th those children are producing their own alcohol instead of going out and, you know, and, and drinking it. So um, they're being produced by their own bacteria. And later on, there were some studies that actually looked at um, uh, alcohol pr production and um, alcohol metabolizing genes in the livers of these children and showing that those kids have active alcohol metabolism in their liver. So uh, interesting findings that maybe the non-alcoholic fatty liver at the end is alcoholic fatty liver. It's just that the source of the alcohol is different. Um, being one joke. <laughs> um, if pooping is a call of nature... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on to um, so just a, a little bit about what perhaps we know about inflammatory bowel disease. There's a lot of data coming, um, you know, a, a lot of interesting new data, especially with very early onset IBD. That's, you know, one of these categories of IBD. Um, that is, you know, make us like scratch our heads, you know, what's, what's going on? You know, there's some genetic um, relationship to that, even more so than like the regular pediatric IBD. Um, so there's a lot of data now that's, that's looking at the virome. Like what are those viruses doing in, the, in a little 18-month-old uh, uh, that has inflammatory bowel disease? So um, there's going to be more and more of that. Um, but just taking you back a little bit, we had um, some pediatric IBD data. Again, that, those are those are all um, um, things that were done here. Um, so um, we looked at children that were hospitalized with severe uh, ulcerative colitis and from North America, like different places. Um, those were treatment naive, like they just got diagnosed and we're getting a stool sample from them. Um, and then compared them to uh, 26 healthy children. Um, and we looked at responders and non-responders. This is a long time ago when steroids were really the best thing that we could do. So there were responders or non-responders towards steroids. Um, that's before we got all the fancy schmancy stuff that we're using now. Um, and we looked at the diversity. So, you know, there's a lot of organisms or a lot of bacteria that live within the intestine, right? And that... The, the variability or the variety of these organisms is a really healthy thing. Um, when we don't see that variability or diversity, then we start to see um, problems happen. So if you look carefully at this, um, this is the healthy side. And this was back when we had um, uh, microarray chips. So what, what is that? So basically, it's kind of a glorified PCR. So you have 
certain sequences that you know, okay, so E. coli has like uh, all these nucleotides and you kind of put it on a chip and then another organism. And at that time we had 92 uh, organisms. We were so happy, 92. There are now thousands and thousands, right? So 92 organisms, oh, we're gonna like, you know, discover the moon. So, um, but here it shows that, you know, the healthy children have quite a bit of organisms, a lot of them. But then on the opposite side, the kids with ulcerative colitis, they really don't have very many. And the ones that they had were not good ones, not good players like staff, like E. coli. Um, and we also looked at um, which ones responded to treatment and which ones did not. And the ones that had the lowest um, diversity were the non-responders. And at that time, we really didn't have any good way of knowing who's going to respond or who wouldn't be responding. So showing that the microbiome is related to their ability even before they get treatment. So that respond, responders or not responders were after those um, stool samples were collected. So you, you go back and say, okay, well, yeah, you could perhaps predict who's going to respond or not just based on, uh, on the diversity. You know, they have enough organisms, enough diverse organisms or not. Um, okay, so this is a, another um, uh, paper that just goes to say that, um, you know, the healthy versus IBG, like ulcerative colitis, you know, you can tell right away that there's some differences here, the blue versus the red. Um, but also um, what uh, their, um, the, 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 the different fungi also within, you know, the IBG microbiome can also look different. Um, and the bacterial family will also look different. But the reason I brought this up is um, this here. So this is MCS1, MCS2, MCS3, MCS4. So what does that mean? Um, so when, they, when those researchers looked at the microbiome of uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, just by eyeballing the microbiome, you would see like those are similar the MCS1, they just called it MCS1. And then MCS2, MCS3, and MCS4. Um, and you could see that the bacterial patterns, just by looking at not anything clinical, right? Just by looking at their microbiome, they look different, right? So then they went back, they did it backwards. So when we do our IBD studies, we say, okay, so Johnny had, um, you know, this phenotype, you know, has, um, you know, left-sided disease or whatever. Uh, and this person had pain colitis, and then we compared their microbiome. So they did, did, did the exact opposite, pretty much. You know, they looked at the microbiome and said, okay, what, what clinical features can distinguish what a microbiome can look like? And um, you could see here that um, the clinical colitis activity, so how, how severe their uh, disease presentation, you could see differences there. Um, number of extra colonic symptoms. So did they have arthritis? Did they have iritis? Did they have other things? And you could see that when they look at the microbiome patterns, you could see that they can be different clinically. Um, number of relatives with IBD. So <laughs> genetics from like way back. Um, and then years since they've been diagnosed. So if they've been diagnosed for a long time, their microbiome can look different from the ones that were just diagnosed. Um, so th that shows that the microbiome can actually, you know, show you some clinical features um, just by looking at the pattern of the microbiome. Uh, but not only that, they also had it uh, divided with the metabolites. What are they producing? Inflammatory markers and so on. They, they look different between all these um, uh, uh, microbiome profiles. Okay, so these are uh, data that we um, had looking at very early onset um, IBD and ethnicity. We have a lot of Hispanic children in um, Los Angeles um, and showing that, you know, they tend to have, you know, um, IBD at a, at a younger age compared to the ones that are not Hispanic. Um, and, um, you know, whether they tend to have uh, perhaps a little bit more pancolitis than the, than the non-Hispanic children. Um, and they also tend to have more colectomy than, um, you know, the non-Hispanic children. Um, and we looked at um, ethnicity and how that is different between, you know, uh, children that are Hispanic versus the children that are not Hispanic. And you could see some differences there. 
Um, short chain fatty acids is one of the things that um, was uh, very intriguing. You know, short chain fatty acids are being produced by the bacteria, being orchestrated uh, through the, the bacteria, especially things like butyrate, for example. And butyrate is uh, one of the short chain fatty acids that are very important for the um, health of the colon. So it keeps the colon going. It's, we call it the fuel of colonocytes. And there was, uh, for the, uh, the Hispanic children that we take care of with IBD, there's absolutely there's very little production uh, of the butyrate. Um, and that we think perhaps could be related to why, you know, their, pre their phenotype is different. So um, that's something that we're kind of looking into um, as uh, this. We also, of course, with the short chain fatty acids, part of it is diet. So we looked at the diet and we were um, kind of surprised that their diet, when you break it down into, you know, soluble fiber and soluble fiber, there wasn't really a whole lot of difference between, you know, the, the, the Hispanic children and the non-Hispanic children that we take care of. Um, so we learned about what the microbiome does in health, right? And what modifies the microbiome. We also learned about the microbiome and disease. I only picked on, you know, a few uh, things, a couple of things actually. Um, but now I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about how do we modify the microbiome? How do we make it work for us? So um, many ways you can modify the microbiome, some good ways and not, some not so good ways. So um, antimicrobial drugs, we all use antibiotics, right? We use antibiotics for IBD and other things. Um, so there's a list of antibiotics that um, have been used that have shown uh, to impact the microbiome, changes the microbiome. You give somebody Cipro, for example, that will change their microbiome. Um, so can we modify the microbiome? The answer is yes. And how good are they? You know, the antibiotics are not going to distinguish, oh, you're a good microbiome, I'm going to keep you alive. You're a bad one, I'm going to kill you. So um, not, not a good way to modify the microbiome in general. Um, and do they even you know, alter the microbiome in general. I'm sorry, we're switching on to probiotics, and probiotics is a topic that's really big on its own. Um, I always get a lot of questions about probiotics, and I'm happy to still answer as many questions as you like, but um, so probiotics, can they modify the microbiome? Um, it depends on which article we read. So <laughs> it's a long list. Um, some of them uh, show yes, some of them show no. For, for us here, we had a, a study, probiotic study, looking at VSL3. It's like a cocktail of probiotics, like eight different strains of uh, probiotics that we gave for kids who had uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And did it change the microbiome? No. They, they got colonized. Like the list of those eight organisms, you could actually detect them in the stools. And once you stop, it goes away. Um, so they get colonized temporarily. But they really don't change the microbiome. Like the big players of the microbiome stay the same before, after, doesn't matter. Uh, oops. So how can we really change the microbiome? So fecal microbial transplant, has anybody um, heard of it? Or, all right, awesome. Has anybody had a patient that got fecal microbial transplant? <laughs> okay, awesome. So, um, there are different names for fecal microbial transplant. They try to say FMT. They try to say different things. They try to avoid the fecal and the poop and the, but but it doesn't work. You have to have some sort of. <laughs> so a lot of people refer to it as FMT because you're not saying fecal or stools or poop. So this is one of the early studies. Another intriguing look at the microbiome. So this is one of the early, not a child, that was an adult, uh, one of the early studies that published what happens to the microbiome before and after fecal transplant. And our poster child is going to be Clostridium difficile, right? So when everything else fails, fecal transplant is magic when it comes to recurrent C. diff. So this, is, this was an adult patient that had fecal transplant, one of the early ones. And if you look at this first stack, remember those stacks that are different kinds of bugs within the GI tract? Um, so this is patient day minus seven. So that's just talking to the patient about fecal transplant, nothing more, you haven't done anything, right? Maybe that 
I believe that person was on metronidazole, if I remember, it's been a while. So now the, the, the criteria, like the treatment for C. diff is different, right? There's different guidelines that have now come out. Um, but anyway, so day minus seven, you see um, different stacks of different organisms there, even uh, uh, Clostridium, Romanococcus, uh, Lactobacillus, Streptococcus, and so on, right? All these stacks. And then this is day zero. What is day zero? That person had colonoscopy, right? So day zero is different from day minus seven, right? Because probably because of the clean out, right? So you see some stacks, the stacks look different, the colors look different, the amount. So, so how big is the stack shows how much of that organism is there. The bigger the stack, the, the bigger the amount, the bigger the number of organisms within that like lactobacillus or whatever, right? Am I confusing you? Okay. So um, this looks even messed up, right? So here is patient, donor, day zero, the healthy one, right? What's the color that is now showing up? Orange, big orange piece here. Those are bacteroides to the point that we think that even the bacteroides alone may be all you need for recurrent C. diff treatments because they don't have bacteroides. So um, so this is patient, I'm um, sorry, donor, healthy donor in the middle, right there with the big orange. And this is day 14. So that's fecal transplant for the patient here, minus seven, zero, same patient, right? So look at the orange that's now getting populated, right? And this is day 14. So when I, um, I was actually giving rounds right in the same spot in uh, the late 90s, beginning like 2001-ish. Um, and I was talking specifically about fecal transplant and saying, it, they'll probably poop it out. I don't think it's going to do anything, but it's pr proven wrong. So it's at 14 days, they haven't pooped it out. The bacteroides have been taken in and are populating, they're growing, right? And look at this, day 33. Day 33, you're still seeing bacteroides and the patient is fine. Yes. Maybe, maybe not. So it, it shows you Clostridium, right? Not Clostridium difficile necessarily, right? There are a lot of Clostridium. And actually, healthy people have a lot of Clostridium. It's just that having, you know, the C. diff part. And it may be a very small part of the microbiome. You know, we PCR those kids, right? To, to, or at least where, where I am, we PCR. <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah, actually, some of the clostridia aren't there. Um, and again, this is in the, uh, you know, uh, from like 15 years ago, 2010, 13 years ago. So um, they may not have had, you know, the, the more sophisticated microbiome just by looking at what they had there. Um, but the idea is after day 33, there's still bacteroides and those, that patient is fine, does, did not have recurrence of C. diff. Um, so for us, we actually took it out all the way to 12 months. So here's your donor has a lot of bacteroides. Now, I'm sorry, it's brown, not orange, um, but pre FMT, no oranges. And then I'm sorry, no brown and up 12 months, you know, doing really well and, and moving on, still having, um, you know, the, the bacteroides. Um, okay. So we are also part of multi-center um, studies for fecal transplant because each center probably do maybe 10, 15 or something like that. But we wanted like 300 or 400. So um, there's um, um, a, 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 an interest group through our society where we all kind of came together, you know, a bunch of centers that looked at, you know, um, our data uh, for fecal transplant for children. And there are 335 uh, children. Uh, they were followed for at least two months. 81% had a su successful outcome following a single FMT and 86.6 after, you know, more than one. So it goes to, to show, I mean, those are patients, I don't know if you've uh, followed, um, you know, kids that have recurrent C. diff, you know, after their third C, C. diff, you know, it's going to come back, right? So for them to have clearance of their C. diff, 86%, 
when it's almost like 0%, if you didn't give them the FMT, that's a, it's a pretty good, uh, robust kind of data. So the conclusion was that FMT is effective. <laughs> um, so FMT in immune compromised children, uh, FMT in an inflammatory bowel disease, um, you know, a lot of the kids with inflammatory bowel disease also have C. diff. So it does clear uh, the C. diff from these patients. And it's, it's fairly safe. Uh, immune compromised children, you're talking about kids that have had liver transplant or, you know, some or bone marrow transplant or have congenital immune deficiency. Um, and there was, um, you know, same uh, likelihood of shaking off their C. diff you know, 80 some percent, 86 percent. So those um, are very um, important pieces of information for us to show that, yes, you know, FMT can work. It's safe. It can be used for immunocompromised individuals. It can be used for IBD. Um, so what happens if you do FMT for somebody and they go back and they have to be back on antibiotics, especially like UTIs seem to be a big one. Um, because a lot of the times they'll use um, anaerobic coverage, and that can be not good for C. diff. So yes, we have seen those, um, and yes, we work with um, you know the the primary care uh, providers, um, you know, to minimize the amount of antibiotics if if possible. But of course, if they need the antibiotic, they need the antibiotic. So we've had we probably had done maybe 50, and we've had you know some recurrences with the antibiotics, but not very many. Um, so 82% of patients that had durable cure of um, CDI 20 or um, recurrent C. diff infection, uh, 22 months after FMT, patients with recurrence had more post-FMT antibiotic exposure, so no-brainer, um, underscoring the need for thoughtful antibiotic use and a potential role for prophylactic microbiome enrichment to reduce recurrence. Um, so we also have done um, some work looking at the microbiome in children with ulcerative colitis without C. diff, just ulcerative colitis. And we have seen some respond and some not responding. And this, all this gibberish stuff is showing um, the difference in the uh, different organisms that we recovered in the stools, the microbiome of the children, and which ones tend to respond, which ones tend to not respond. Um, and we also looked at uh, short-chain fatty acid production and other things in, in that uh, population. You could see that um, their butyrate level, so this is a baseline, so before fecal transplant. This is uh, from the donor. You can see a healthy amount of uh, uh, butyrate. And this was not a Hispanic study, by the way. So they, they were producing you know, a good amount of butyrate, uh, but not as much as healthy people. Um, and this is post-FMT. You could see that it's gone up some, but uh, not a whole lot. So the last um, couple of slides, you know, the gut microbiome and antibiotics. And it's one of the biggest hits to the microbiome would be antibiotics. Um, so uh, there's some studies, uh, not from the <laughs> United States as much, um, from England, because they have this big registry where everybody, like, goes into, like, whenever they see their pediatrician or something, they... Uh, would be part of that big registry. So you could actually query questions, you know, if you take antibiotics when you're little, what happens to you when you're older? So um, um, th actually this particular study just shows what happens when you take Cipro. So this is David Relman from Stanford, you know, showing what happens after um, antibiotics. And each dot, remember the PCOA plot, you know, close and stuff. Um, so this green, the dark green is like at the beginning, and all the green uh, are from one patient, right? And all the uh, blue is from one patient and so on. And you could see like day after day, they're collecting stools, and you could see the drift of the microbiome away from where it was, where it started. Same thing for the red, same thing for the blue. And this is only one course, first course of Cipro. You give them another course, and it's like a ganache. So it, and some of them didn't recover, you know, they never went back to their dark spot where they started. Um, so what happens to someone who had antibiotics when they were young? Um, again, uh, data from Britain um, and showing uh, the proportion of subjects with inflammatory bowel disease. So those are kids that had antibiotics when they were little, and now they're looking at uh, their, who has IBD, right? So the ones in the red were exposed to antibiotics. The ones in the blue were not exposed to antibiotics. You could see that 
um, the proportion of the ones that were exposed to antibiotics when they were little had a higher um, percent of developing inflammatory bowel disease. And whether it was one course or more than one course when they were little, um, you know, can make a little bit of a difference. And the age when they were exposed to it. So the younger they were, the more likely that they would predict the development of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so that goes to say that you know, ju judicial use of antibiotics, especially in a young age, especially if you're going to kill a lot of the anaerobes, um, it'd be very helpful to, uh, uh, to uh, if at all possible, to avoid that. Um, antibiotic use in uh, early life, antibiotic exposure in children within the first two years of life associated with asthma, um, atopic dermatitis, allergic ri rhinitis, and not only that, it's what antibiotic you've been exposed to. <laughs> so if you've been uh, doing macrolides, for example, then you have more likelihood of, because the, remember the microbiome is selective, you know, not all the antibiotics are going to kill the same kinds of organisms, right? So um, you have different antibiotics that can increase your risk for developing certain disorders. So in summary, um, antibiotic use can impact the gut microbiome. I hope I convinced you uh, with, with the data. Um, early life use of antibiotics may predispose to diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease. The gut microbiome could be modified through diet, antimicrobials, probiotics, and FMT. Um, another reason to advocate for breastfeeding um, exclusively for the first six months of life for the AEP recommendation because we've seen what the diet can do to the microbiome. Um, and um, if we can prevent or treat pediatric IBD, obesity, autism, allergies, it's a very um, optimistic list. <laughs> um, it's an open field for study for, uh, I see some residents here in the room. It's, a, it's an amazing field to look at. Um, uh, there's also patient donor compatibility, like, you know, like what's your blood type, you know, type of thing. Um, and then personalized medicine you know, specific microorganisms. We talked about C. diff, maybe just bacteroides or uh, IBD, maybe a specific organism that uh, would be needed to help perhaps prevent, um, you know, the development of IBD in high-risk populations. So um, this is kind of an optimistic list here uh, for future directions. And I wanted to uh, acknowledge um, Dr. Pickoff, who actually helped me quite a bit um, you know, uh, with, with my early career here. Um, and I remember him talking with me about the first article that I, uh, that, um, eventually got published and, you know, even going through these, you know, little things to, you know, get a, a first publication for microbiome here, Dr. Mezov, because he put up with me, <laughs> Dr. Daniel Prudhomme, because he also put up with me <laughs> in a funny way. <laughs> and then Dr. Frank Abernathy, who did a lot of, he's uh, uh, one of our PhD scientists, um, who uh, did a lot of the microbiome work um, here. Uh, Dr. Oleg Pally uh, at um, Wright State, uh, who I believe is either associate or full professor. We were crazy at that time, we're thinking that we could do microbiome work. Um, and then all the funding and uh, uh, that we got later. And thank you so much for um, for the opportunity to be here. Oh, everyone poops. This is the best book ever. I was exposed to it here in Dayton, Ohio. That was the first time I saw that book, and I recommend it. It's like the most hilarious. It's really cool. If you don't have it, uh, oops, uh, try to get it. Uh, oh, and one of the things that I learned. So I now live in California, and coming back here. <laughs> One of the things, um, you know, I, when we left, I think the gas prices were between six and seven dollars a gallon. <laughs> so looking at the gas prices at the at the pump here, <laughs> you have a you, you give an arm or a leg or a firstborn if you're in Cal this is California, right? This is not Dayton. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for um, your attention. That little kid is up to no good. I think he's going to be our next donor. <laughs> Okay. okay, do we have any questions in the audience? Yeah, uh, this is Dr. Gupta. Very nice presentation. Um, I just have a question. I mean, it's good to do this transplants and everything, but before these are done, you know, um, do you recommend children who are having problems to use like 
diet change and probiotics and how long do you recommend that and do you see any improvement? Great question. Thank you. Um, so you're probably referring to recurrent C. diff, right? So the data on the probiotics are, um, you know, there's prevention data and there's treatment data. Treatment data, not good, right? Uh, prevention data, there's very controversial because probiotic studies, unfortunately, are pretty heterogeneous. So there are some that decide to do lactobacillus, some that decide to do uh, bifido, some that decide to do uh, e. coli nissel. I mean, there, there are a number of organisms. So I think of them as antibiotics, right? So not all antibiotics are the same, right? You use something, for, amoxicillin is different coverage than Cipro, for example, right? So, um, so probiotics are the same way. They're not all equal. They're very different. And also the doses are not the same. So the problem with, um, with probiotic data is it's really heterogeneous. So you look at um, systematic reviews and it's very controversial, you know, for prevention of C. diff. Um, so have we done it before? Yes. I mean, with the assumption that probiotics are in general safe to use, you know, there, there are some uh, issues with them though. So please don't get me wrong, especially for NICU babies, would not recommend them at all. There's just been a death that's been reported a couple of months uh, ago from Avivo, which is specifically for babies. Like, um, So anyway, so um, I'm sorry, I digress. Um, so the, the, to answer your question is, um, we're always looking for easy ways, uh, but unfortunately, your current C. diff, we've, we've used probiotics for those kids multiple times. They don't seem to um, help very much at all, to be honest with you. Um, so, but we have ways of, of trying to prevent the recurrence of C. diff without fecal transplant. And when all else fails, we just did a fecal transplant for a little girl who had... Um, Water, so she uh, ha actually had an oleostomy, and she continued to have an oleostomy for quite some time. She's now seven, six years. She's been on vancomycin. Every time she stops the vancomycin, it's the only antibiotic that would work, and she's not colonized because we could sh see that she has small bowel enteritis, severe enough that she gets admitted to the hospital. A day of vancomycin will like turn her around like crazy. So, and she's positive and negative with symptoms and not symptoms. So we were pretty comfortable saying this is not colonization. Um, so for the first time, knock on one, this is like three months now, <laughs> with, after FMT, she'd been off of vancomycin after six years of being on vancomycin. So kind of a long answer, but probiotics maybe can be helpful, but usually not. I, thank you for the presentation. Um, so on the topic of probiotics, since I know that seems to be where your last question was as well. I can repeat the question on the microphone. So when you were talking about Let me see if I can rephrase the question. So the question is, why are probiotics not able to change the microbiome? Um, it's a good question. I don't know that people have actually looked into it, but if I want to take a guess, um, um, certain nutrients, like you mentioned, uh, perhaps would be, um, you know, the gut microbiome has a core. It's just two parts of the microbiome, right? There's a core that just doesn't change, no matter what you do. <laughs> And then there's like the other part of the microbiome that can perhaps be changed. So um, like for the FMT, for example, you know, sometimes they give them antibiotics right before to kind of clear some of the microbiome before you uh, engraft the fresh microbiome. So it's a good question. I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very possible.
All right, this mic is being finicky. Melissa, you can go ahead and come off mute with your question. Hi, my question is in regards to children who are on continuous prophylactic antibiotics, um, specifically for um, urology patients for vesicourinary reflux. Is there any evidence um, that has looked specifically at those kids and the effects of those continuous antibiotics on their gut microbiome? Uh, another good question. I have not seen anything for chronic antibiotic use, uh, but you can get a hint of that from the like acute antibiotic use because you know they follow them for a while, and even though they may have stopped the antibiotics, they're still having issues. Uh, we have actually looked at that particular kid that I was talking to you about. We looked at her microbiome a bunch of times, and she definitely has a very different microbiome. Um, and she um, she didn't even have UTI. She just had you know, other uh, respiratory slash some UTI, but not very much. Um, so she had, she had like a cocktail of different antibiotics and her microbiome looked very different. So I wouldn't be surprised if the microbiome really looks different with uh, chronic antibiotic use. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> chat. Okay. Um, so the question is, how would you recommend using this information to tailor antibiotic treatment uh, in young children, particularly with the gut altering antibiotics you listed? Thank you for your time. Um, well, first, I think we all know that um, it, what I'm trying to say is sometimes the antibiotic may not be necessary, right? If the antibiotic is necessary, it's necessary, right? Um, but if if there's if you think there may have been a viral infection, for example, and maybe waiting a little bit, um, we work with uh, with primary care providers and uh, antibiotic choice after the uh, fecal transplant. Um, the more broad spectrum the antibiotic is, the more likely that um, C. diff is going to come back. The more anaerobic, like Cipro, like, um, um, you know, all the anaerobic ones, um, they tend to augment and they tend to have more of a hit on the gut than the ones that are narrow spectrum. And for some reason, sulfa doesn't seem to be as obnoxious, but th those are all personal observations. They're not, they're not really written in stone. We have one more in the audience. So should we do just one last question? <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if you heard. The question was, uh, what about children with inflammatory bowel disease, ones with joint disease versus ones without joint disease? Is that is that about? Okay. Um, so <laughs> we haven't looked at it, but we do have, you know, a, a fair number of children with joint disease, and this would be the first thing I do when I go home and look at the, <laughs> look and see if there's a difference in the in their profile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and their 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 medications can be a little bit different, and so there's uh, there's all these variables that we would have to keep in mind. But that's a really good question. I promise you, if I have the answer, I will let you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I think that that takes us to the end. Thank you so much for being a great audience. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm sorry about the microphone. Oh, no, I was just going to apologize. How are you? I'm Zach. I'm the. Thank you. Yes. This is just what I do. Uh, so I actually did my fellowship at your neighbors. Uh, not chalk. Uh, 
Uh, UCLA.